Welcome back to our series on the parables of Jesus. Parables are earthly stories that have heavenly meanings. They are simple stories designed to teach a moral or a, a spiritual lesson. Jesus chose to use parables throughout his ministry. There are about three dozen of them in the, the Gospels. And we're taking a look at a, a handful of them, maybe a dozen or so of them, as we go through this series. Matthew chapter 25 contains some of the most memorable and descriptive parables about the kingdom of heaven. There's the parable of the ten virgins who either were or weren't prepared for the coming of the groom. There's the parable of the talents, which describes the need for we as disciples of God to use the talents that we've been given. But the third one, the last one in Matthew chapter 25, is called the parable of the sheep and the goats. And not only is it the topic of today's lesson, but it's also a powerful message in today's world. Not only is it full of direction about how we have the responsibility to support others, Jesus uses some very powerful language and some very vivid imagery to drive home the point. So, the last of the uh, parables from Matthew chapter 25. It appears that Matthew chapter 25 is set during the last few days of Jesus' life. The Jews are preparing for the Passover, and Jesus is preparing to be the sacrifice. As we see in Matthew chapter 26, the Jewish leadership is dedicated to killing Jesus by this time. So these are probably some of the last teachings of our Lord. Now with this in mind, it's understandable why Jesus would be very direct and serious in his messages. And I get the sense that there's something different about those parables that we find in Matthew chapter 25. The hearers need to understand that this is serious business. It's more than just about life and death. It involves eternal life and death. Jesus had already prepared them for the fact that the world was about to turn upside down. Now he needs to prepare the world for their understanding of their own judgment. And it wasn't going to just be based on where they lived, but how they lived. And with that, we have the parable of the sheep and goats. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The parable begins with a judgment scene featuring the glorious Son of Man. 
considering what's about to happen, maybe this was a subliminal reminder that no matter what would transpire over the next few days, Jesus was the Messiah, and his ministry was not going to be disrupted by something as simple as death. Jesus was going to be the one who will do the judging, and the presence of the angels in this parable remind us of his position of authority. The judgment scene begins with the separation of the faithful and the unfaithful. The illustration is how a shepherd would separate the sheep from the goats. Now, I'm not really understanding all the nuances of this imagery, but it's apparent that there was a preference for sheep over goats because, as we see here, the sheep are going to be those who are blessed. And maybe this goes back to some of the other parables about the good shepherd or some of the, the other things about that. But again, stay, as we stay focused on this parable, there will be a separation, some on the right, some on the left. There's one thing that's obvious, though. The shepherd knew which one of his sheep were the ones to bless. In the judgment scene, the king blesses those on his right with their inheritance. But it's interesting that their blessing was not because of a pedigree that they had through their lineage. What brought on the blessing were their actions. And their actions were that they fed the hungry, they brought a drink to someone who was thirsty. They were hospitable to strangers. They clothed the naked. They visited the sick, and they visited those in prison. And it's interesting how Jesus presents this. He says, when I was one of these things, then you did one of those things. Now, it might have been confusing to us, but it's even more confusing to the sheep. When did we ever see you in this condition? Well, the king says that as often as they helped others in that condition, they did it to him. Anybody would help out a king in trouble, but the righteous were willing to do what it took to help anyone and everyone. And because of this mindset, because of this servant heart, they were going to be rewarded for their willingness to serve. Now, the second act of this parable is almost the mirror opposite of what we see in the first half. The king condemns the goats for what they did not do. He had praised the sheep for what they did do. Now he condemns those on the left for what they didn't do. They didn't feed the hungry or aid the thirsty. They were not hospitable to strangers. They didn't clothe the naked. They didn't visit the sick or those in prison. And just as the sheep, those on the right, were shocked that they had done this, these folks are shocked that they hadn't done this. Their response is the same. When did we see you in all of these conditions and not help you? And Jesus responds that as often as they ignored others in need, they ignored him. Now, Again, it is tempting to get way too deep into some of the nuances of the parable, but I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about how Jesus describes their eternal punishment. He says that they were cast into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, I believe that we can take this literally. In fact, there's a lot of reference to eternal fire or eternal torment. But even if we don't comprehend what it means... I think we can count on the fact that this is a terrible place that these folks are going. The people on the right, the sheep, they are blessed and rewarded. The people on the left, the goats, they are condemned and tortured. Now, let's take a look and see if we can um, find out what Jesus is trying to teach. Let's do this in two ways. Number one, what is he trying to teach to the people during his day? I think the Jews were holding on to the notion that they were a chosen people. They were God's favorites. They were in line for glory just because of who or maybe their perspective of whose they are. And this may have led to some pride, but it may have also led to some apathy. We're already blessed. Why do we need to help others? 
Additionally, many of those who are opposing Jesus' ministry and his message viewed righteousness as a caste system. The good people looked good. Those who were poor or outcast were probably getting what they deserved. They felt that they needed to spend time blessing the blessed. But Jesus turns this thought process on its head. The righteous are those who go out and make a difference in the lives of others. They serve God by serving others. They'll be rewarded by living like godly, not just looking like the godly. And oh, by the way, there will be a judgment based on how people live their lives on earth. The standard would be if you love one another, if you treat each other with care and respect. Now, Jesus would echo this a little bit later on in the upper room with his closest disciples. But for now, the parable of the sheep and the goats reminds those of his day that they need to be working and that they need to look to find those people that they can help. What does it teach us today? I believe this teaching in this parable should be close to our hearts today because it's needed in the church in modern times. It's tempting to base Christianity on how we look. Do we say the right things? Do we attend services at the right places? Do we, do we look the part? But in reality, Christians are going to be known for the relationships that they have with others. And it's not just going to be those relationships that we form in the foyer of the church building. We have a responsibility to reach out to those who are in need. And when we do, not only do we bless their lives, but we also praise our God. This parable reminds us that to maintain pure hearts, we need to get our hands dirty. Christianity isn't just about what we do on Sundays. It's who we are each and every day of the week. Christianity isn't just about reading our Bibles or singing from the hymnal. It's demonstrated by reaching out to those who need us the most. Are we helping people, especially those who are struggling to get their lives on track? If not, here is the question. Will God be willing to help us into eternal life? Folks, we all realize that we need all the help we can get to be saved because we can't do it on our own. And here we learn that that begins by providing care and concern to our fellow man who need us for help as well. It's a great parable. And it had a poignant message, not just in the first century, but in the 21st century as well. Now, some thought and discussion questions. Number one, who do you know that is in need right now? Number two, what talents do you have that will help them meet that need? Number three, why is it so important to help others in need? 